Working within the existing street pattern, Raguzzini constructed five apartment blocks that collectively define the square facing Sant'Ignazio. Shops occupy the ground floor with apartments above. The proximity of the piazza to the developing center of the papal bureaucracy around Palazzo Montecitorio made these apartments particularly desirable to the growing middle class of officials who worked there. The five freestanding blocks are visually linked to one another by means of a circular geometry that generates their curving ground plans and facade elevations. This foreshortened view up to the cornice level reveals how one such circle unifies the skyline profiles of three of the blocks. The caption accompanying Vasi's print of Sant'Ignazio in the Magnificenze calls attention to the apartment buildings defining the piazza, noting that they, and I quote, form a theater in front of the church. Vasi's use of the term teatro to describe the piazza conforms to a practice that can be traced back to the 17th century. Significantly, in his verbal formulation, it is the buildings themselves that actively shape this overtly scenographic space. Vasi's sensitivity to the buildings and monuments that enrich the cityscape of the papal capital clearly extended to the streets and public spaces that animate the urban fabric. His view of the papal palace on the Quirinal Hill provides another revealing example of the dynamic process in which streets and piazzas exert an influence on the placement and design of surrounding buildings, while architecture, in turn, contributes to the definition of urban space. The Piazza di Monte Cavallo was brought to completion immediately following Vasi's arrival in Rome in 1736, and the irregular space occupying the center of his composition is defined by a group of buildings providing for the needs of the papal household and government offices. Alessandro Specchi's Scuderia, housing with stables, anchors the scene at the left, while Ferdinando Fuga's Palazzo della Consulta closes the piazza on the right, its receding orthogonals leading the viewer's eye to the papal palace of the Quirinal. The palaces of the Quirinal and the Consulta frame the Strada Pia, one of the major new avenues laid out in the 1560s. This shaft of space terminates in the ancient sculptural group of the horse tamers, situated at center, which was enriched by the addition of an obelisk under Pius VI at the end of the century. To the left, the piazza extends to the low horizontal of, a, of the building that accommodates the household uh, staff of the Quirinal Palace. Vasi conveys the ceremonial function of this space by showing a carriage issuing from the portal of the papal palace, and the mounted guards housed in the Palazzo della Consulta drawn up in parade formation before its facade. Of all the many additions to the urban fabric of Rome made during the 18th century, perhaps the most dramatic and spectacular is the construction of the Trevi Fountain and the shaping of the small piazza in it fronts up on. A detail from Vasi's 1765 Prospetto, admirably illustrates the relationship between the Fontana di Trevi and the tower of the Palazzo of Pignano. Uh, this is the tower of the Papal Palace, not uh, here, the fountain. In 1643, when Bernini shifted the orientation of the Renaissance fountain from the west to the south, he did so in order to make it visible from the papal palace. Just to be clear about this, the fountain uh, formerly uh, faced in this direction. It was reoriented so that it could be viewed uh, from uh, that uh, privileged uh, position. A detail from the Noli plan shows how the fountain is embedded in the pre-existing street system. None of the streets leading to the piazza reveals more than a partial glimpse of the fountain withholding a full view, uh, or a complete view, until the visitor enters the piazza, at which point the commanding scale of the Trevi exerts the maximum possible impact. Uh, here, I think you can uh, see the Trevi uh, space and occupying the piazza, and the several streets that lead into the piazza. None of them um, uh, is, permits uh, before 
uh, opening into the piazza, uh, a full or a complete view of the fountain. Construction on the Trevi began in 1732, following the design of Vasi's fellow Arcadian, Nicola Salvi. Over the next three decades, work continued sporadically. One of Vasi's earliest prints, dating 1739, shows the architectural component of the fountain completed, but the sculpture still not in place. Vasi's later view from the fourth volume of the Magnificenza, published in 1756, shows the temporary plaster mock-ups of the sculpture in place. Permanent marble statues were installed only in 1762. Vasi's depiction of the Trevi acknowledges its extremely scenographic nature. Salvi's architecture functions as a scenic backdrop to the action of the sculpture and the rush of the water. Moreover, the stairs leading down to the fountain serve to accommodate an audience, one that interacts with the water flowing from the fountain. Piranesi's more elevated viewpoint emphasizes the theatrical relationship between audience and spectacle. Like the facades of so many 17th century churches, the sheer mass of the Trevi dominates the square, an effect compounded by the way in which the fountain proper moves out from the facade to occupy most of the area of the piazza. Moreover, the disparity in scale between the Trevi and the surrounding buildings is increased by their proximity to one another. Since Salvi was an Arcadian, it's no surprise to see that his design for the Trevi responds to nature and engages with pastoral themes. Like the Bosco Parazio, the Trevi um, is an example of Marshall's Rus in Urbe, literally bringing water into the city from the rustic country springs, first identified by a pastoral maiden, shown during one of the barriers on the fountains. Natural themes are also evident in the irregularity of the artificial marine reefs that dominate the fountain in the profusion of sculptural flora and fauna that enrich them, in the principle of the circulation of water expressed allegorically, in the process of organic growth and decay evident in the collapsing pilaster at the far right and in the asymmetrical shape of the piazza. Since I began this lecture with quotations by Europeans, Adam and Goethe, Diderot and de Bros, perhaps it is appropriate to conclude with a passage written by an American author. In The Marble Faun, published in 1860, Nathaniel Hawthorne uses a Roman setting in order to contrast the values of the New World with those of the Old. And the Trevi provides a backdrop for a crucial scene set at night. Hawthorne's remarks on the fountain combine two contradictory themes. One, his distaste for the perceived excesses of the Baroque style. The other, his apparently reluctant appreciation for its exuberance. His description begins with a reference to, and I quote, the absurd design of the fountain, where some sculptor of Bernini's school has gone absolutely mad in marble. <laughs> in the next paragraph, however, the author's puritanical criticism quickly turns to admiration. He is struck by the Trevi's joyful depiction <clears throat> of nature and the lively civic life the fountain inspires nearby. Hawthorne praises the artificial marine lake group, the artificial marine reefs, and I quote, strewn with careful art and ordered irregularity. He alludes to the vegetable and fruit dealers, the idlers and tourists, the men with buckets, urchins with cans, and maidens bearing their pictures on their heads. Ultimately, he cannot resist the ensemble, and he observes, quote, and after all, it was as magnificent a piece of work as ever human skill conceived. Even 100 years after Vasi's time, the Baroque splendors of Rome continued to cast their spell. The vision of the city that Vasi captured in his panorama embodies the Rome of careful art and ordered regularity, pardon, ordered irregularity, as Hawthorne puts it. But rather than Hawthorne's fragment, Bazzi's wonderful panorama 
gives us the entire city. He inscribes a quotation from the poet Marshall near the bottom of the print. And here I loosely translate. From here, you can see the seven lordly hills and measure the whole of Rome. And for many of us gathered here this evening, the whole of Rome is as magnificent a piece of work as ever human skill contrived. Thank you. John has kindly agreed to take any questions you might have. Yes, please. Yes, what occasioned the 18th century building boom that you described uh, between 1720 and roughly 1760? Well, um, a number of things. Uh, can you hear me if I stay away from the mic, or would you no, go to the mic. like me close? Okay. Um, of course, booms are relative uh, yeah. to one another, and relative, for example, to the uh, quantity of building that had uh, preceded that in, in the 18th century. This was a relatively modest boom. But uh, I would say primarily um, two factors, uh, the um, perceived and, and the real need on the part of the papal administration to um, provide infrastructure uh, that would stimulate the economy on the one hand, uh, but then on the other, the transformation uh, of the way in which this government was administered, um, the development, for example, of new administrative centers like the Montecitorio, which then um, called upon um, uh, the need uh, for accommodations uh, for people who work in them. Those are two, those are two reasons. There are others, uh, certainly. Um, but um, another way to put it is that there was a very considerable population um, of um, individuals concerned with building. Um, architects numbered in the hundreds uh, in this period. Um, that's not to mention the people who were engaged in the, um, in various ways uh, in the actual process of building. Um, building was one way of providing uh, employment, uh, another form, I mean, something that we're not, um, how shall I put it, today in the United States we're not unfamiliar with. Um, uh, uh, TARP funds, in part, are intended to uh, stimulate the economy. Uh, something like that was going on here as well. Is that all? Well, thank you again, John, very much. So th thank you all very much for coming this evening and enjoying this uh, marvelous talk from John Pinto. Um, our plans are to uh, convene uh, tomorrow morning in this space, correct, Sharon? Yes. And uh, we'll begin at um, 9.45. Did you want to say a few words? Yes, please. You all can do Yes. <laughs> So I'm Sharon Kaplan, I'm a museum educator here at the JSMA, so if you haven't seen me before, that's okay. <coughs> and we are open tonight for this event until 8 o'clock. The galleries are open upstairs, so you're welcome to go upstairs and see the exhibition if you haven't, or visit it again if you have. And we have a reception in the lobby, so you're welcome to nibble, drink. Um, just a reminder, please don't bring anything upstairs that's edible or drinkable. <laughs> but other than that, that's great, and enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you.